Good evening. Welcome to WSBI, your resource for success podcast program, where you get to meet inspiring women-owned businesses from across the country. And now, for your host, Kimberly McElmore. Hey, good evening and welcome to WSBI, your resource for success podcast program, where you get to meet inspiring entrepreneurs and women-owned businesses from across the country. I am your host, Kimberly McLemore, the CEO and founder of the Women's Small Business Initiative, LLC, and an award-winning author. Welcome to another night of sharing. With us, we have our special guest, Merle Orsini. Merle is recognized widely as an innovative aging care thought leader with a laser-sharp understanding of the market. In 1981, she started her first aging care business, a geriatric care managed home care agency that she grew exponentially and successfully sold, earning her a prestigious EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award. In 1998, she founded Core Cubed, a marketing firm dedicated exclusively to aging care providers growing their businesses, where she is now founder and board chair. Her insights into the future of aging care add to her remarkable marketing expertise in the home, health, hospice, and home-centered care industries. While her specialization is private duty home care, her span of her influence encompasses all models of home-based care. Orsini has held many roles in industry, including service for numerous national organizations. But in 2017, Merle was honored to receive the Silver Lifetime Achievement Stevie Award for Women in Business. Merle continues to be highly active at the national level, speaking at regional and national events when an aging care marketing expert or industry futurist perspective is sought. So without further ado, please help me welcome to my platform, Ms. Merle Orsini. Hello, Merle. How are you? Oh, hi, Kimberly, and I am absolutely fabulous today. How about you? I am doing good. I tell you what, that was a mouthful. I was like, Lord, have mercy. I was hoping I was going to get through all (laughs) all of that portion (laughs) with with a breath or two. (laughs) You have a phenomenal bio, but I was like, who helped me get through this? Because I didn't want to miss anything that was important. So I'm so excited (laughs) to have you on today. Thank you. You know, Kimberly, when you live as long as I have, there's a, a lot of years <laughs> to write about. So <laughs> well, it's been fun. I will say that. Well, I bet it has. And we are so excited to have you on. And the listeners are going to learn a lot about you and what you have accomplished and what you're continuing to do in the in the world of um innovative aging care because it's you know something that we don't always talk about but is absolutely something that we need to know but really before we actually dive into some some of the basic interview questions I wanted like to ask please tell the listeners just a little bit more about who Miss Merle Orsini really is <laughs> thank you <laughs> you know um <laughs> I um I started in the entrepreneurial world um with my first business in 1981 but but what that did is actually got me interested and passionate about care at home. So I've, uh, you know, grown businesses successfully. I've had some failures. And currently I am using everything I've learned for all these years and trying to help several things. One is educate about care at home. And the other is I'm working um, as executive vice president with Access, which is a global healthcare technology company that's, whose software actually focuses on making care in the home easier. Mm-hmm. And um, of course, I'm still involved with Core Cubed, the marketing component of the care at home industry. So, mm-hmm. um, and I am a grandmother with four grandchildren within walking distance of where I now live in Asheville, Aww. North Carolina, and um, and continuing to enjoy work every day. I probably should be retired, but I don't see that in my future anytime soon. I'm having too much fun. Well, you know, and that's all it's about. And, you know, I always hear, you know, we all work for retirement, but then I hear a lot of people say once they start retiring or they get retired, they're so bored, they actually go back to doing something. So, you know, it's always good to utilize your your mind because as we all know, if we sit still too long, everything stops, starts to really shut down. So I'm glad that you were actually doing something that you love. And that's really the most important part of, of anything that we do, whether you're in retirement mode or not. But I really want to learn a lot about 
What did you do prior to jumping into business? Obviously, you've been in business for many years. Um, before you started Core Cube, tell us a little bit more about what you were doing before you got to that point and how did the industry or, or how did aging care um, establish and, and having homes be a part of something that you were very interested in? Well, when um, the when I started my first business in 1981, I was in a personal situation where I knew I was going to have to um, to support myself and my two young sons at that time. And I have a master's degree in social work. And if you have any idea what social workers make, mm-hmm. <laughs> it, right. it didn't look like it was going to be a promising future for me and my son. So I I really just sort of hung out my shingle and um, and found some things that I thought I could do and just really started working in a business that was trying to provide help for other people. And it was pretty soon after that that I got my first client who it turned out that she had Alzheimer's disease we didn't Mm -hmm. call it that at the time Mm -hmm. but we were called in to to babysit and that was really the beginning of a very long and successful and in-depth career in caring for people in their own homes Um, and that we took that client um we ended up, her husband, actually, who had hired us uh, to, so we could get out of the house for a few hours a day, um, he died unexpectedly. Mm. And so we ended up inheriting this woman who had Alzheimer's disease, sort of at the mid-stage of Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, Kimberly, I I read everything I could. I um, I got master's level social worker students involved. We had three schools at the time in Louisville that were offering master's in social work. And so I supervised master's level social work students and really worked on how do we make this uh, from frailty to death experience for people Mm -hmm. more enjoyable and satisfactory and safe. And um, and I had no models to follow because uh, there were some people also doing what I was doing at that same time and we did find each other a couple of years later and formed a national organization at the time it was called the National Association of Professional Geriatric Care Managers now it's called Aging Life Care Professionals okay. and so uh, we banded together we started working on how do we provide care for people, again, from frailty to the grave care, and how do we work with the current system to provide care that was outside of what the government was reimbursing for, but was what people really wanted, which mm-hmm. was to age in place at home. So that was really the the beginning, and um, I, I'm a, a continuous learner. I love to read. Um, I'm love to solve problems. <laughs> so right. it was sort of the perfect situation for me. And um, and it was a, a business model whose time had come. And of course, now there's lots and lots of people providing those kinds of services. Mm-hmm. But the model that I developed, which is a care managed model, that model um, is now what Humana at Home uses oh, wow. as their model they bought the model from Larry Sosnow, who had founded a company called Senior Bridge. And um, so it really, I think I was probably 20 or 30 years ahead of my time. In terms right. Of how do we do this? And mm-hmm. uh, the interesting thing is now that is what most of the, um, the people in the care industry are understanding is that if you have an overlay of care management, so someone really paying attention to mm-hmm. what are the options and what's the best care, that really is the best model. So mm-hmm. um, so I feel fortunate that I figured that out early, and um, and that's something that I've been advocating for for, for many years now. Wow. Well, I think it's amazing how we all kind of get pushed into doing something that we're not normally used to doing, even though um, you were in social work. And like I said, social work, we it's and I don't understand why they never pay enough for social work, because it's a lot to have to deal with other people and, and, <laughs> and, you know, and do what they're doing. And then you have to always have to find something else in order to make the ends meet, so to speak. And that's really not what you should have to do um, anytime you're going to school and you're getting degrees and, you know, you're trying to do this type of work. But 
it's just amazing how we all have as business people at one point you get pushed into doing something that you just were not really prepared to do and hadn't really thought about doing. But then here it is because it's something that I always believe that's meant for you to do. You know, we, we all have our own paths, but a lot of times we mm-hmm. think that the paths that we have developed or we think we're going is what God has said that's for us. But we, then we learn later on, no, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. So it's the, the care of, of having to do with, um, people of age, you know, whether it's in our own family or people outside of our family, it is not a conversation that people like to have. Um, you know, we, I lost, no. um, my grandmother five years ago, can't believe it's already five years. And my mom had to go through a lot of the same process, her and her brothers and sisters of trying to find the proper care. Um, cause she was had early Alzheimer's as well. And, you know, it, you're so, we're so scared to put our family members inside of these, um, organizations that you know they have to watch them and supposed to take care of them because you can't be with them 24 7 so and then of course if you're not totally educated on what's going on and you're trying to learn in the the process it's such a scary process so how do you give advice to people who have aging um, parents or grandparents and they're at that point in their lives where they you know decisions have to be made what do you think is always the best benefit of course you know some people can't always afford some of these things but what do you say to them to give them the advice they need to have in order to determine whether they should be in in home care or whether they should be in um, other care outside the home Kimberly that is a great question Um, I always start with that care management component and I say that the, if you start with a an aging life care professional who are the you know modern day geriatric care managers, if you start with someone who actually understands the industry and understands the options available, then it really shortens the process between uh, making a decision and it and it narrows down what kinds of things you need to look into. Because as you so wisely said, no one wants to talk about mm-hmm. have needing care. No one wants to learn about any of this aging care, um, all the options that are available until there is a need. And when that need hits, oftentimes it's sudden. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's not, but oftentimes it's sudden. And the the learning curve is pretty steep. So Uh, The other thing is there isn't a one-size-fits-all. So Mm -hmm. every single person ages differently and has different types of things that are that constitute their frailty. So it might be mental decline or it might be physical decline or it could be both. Everyone has different resources, not only monetary resources, but family support mm-hmm. or neighborhood support. So so um, a geriatric care manager, an aging life care professional, can actually do what we call an assessment where they really take a lot of the factors and consider them and then come back and say, these are the best options for you. Mm-hmm. Yes, you can stay at home with care because you have a good support system and your house is safe and you, everything's on one floor, or no, you don't have any family here, you don't have enough money, right. and we need to start looking at how, and you're, and you're physically frail, um, we're going to have to start looking at where can you age safely. So mm-hmm. um, so it really is different, but I really would start, you know, it'd be like, it, it's really like if um, someone were to give you some money or you were to make some money and you decided you wanted to take that money and parlay it for the future, you would have to go to an expert and get some advice on how best to do that. And the same is true with uh, with aging care. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what I recommend is start with the, with the care manager and then come up with an individualized plan, let the whole family buy into it, and um, and then implement that plan. Right, right. And that makes sense. And like I said, I think a lot of times like we don't have the conversation. So like I said, it's, when it happens, everybody's kind of in this rush of trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do? You know, we, we have the fear of not wanting to see our, our loved ones be left alone and, and making sure you hear, you know, these awful horror stories about what could happen, whether it's in the home or outside the home 
to your loved ones, mm-hmm. but obviously we know we can't be with them 24 seven. So, you know, to, to be able to have this type of information passed mm-hmm. on to people is really important. Um, and like, it's, it's, I think about what my parents are getting older, you know, they're in their, la- their latter part of their seventies. And even though they're in great health, you, it's still something that weighs in the back of your mm-hmm. mind. And, and really, you don't even know, it's not, it's not even always about age. You know, we never know what's going to happen to us, you know, even at my age, no. 50. So you, you think about how do you prepare your family for this and, I think about, you know, what if this happens, you know, how do I prepare my son to take care? They even have the thought in his mind that, you know what, one day I've got to take care of my mom. And, you know, we may joke about it, but it's one of those situations where you do have to take it, uh, take it very seriously. And I, and I can honestly say, I can, you know, in our black communities, these are not the conversations that we have every day until we know we have to have them. And I think it's one of the things that everybody needs to have some mindset about, what what are what is your thoughts about you know it's not just about retirement but what happens whether you retire or not retire because you know it's having that conversation then realizing you're gonna you're gonna get old one day but um the information you're talking about is is very um important but i think the other thing that i want to get into on this conversation is, is the cost because we all know that having somebody take care of you can be extremely expensive how does the determination or how is it determined to to say hey well the state can help you or the state can't help you or, or, you know, how much money do you feel like you have to have? I mean, what would you give advice in it comes to, even as a part of retirement, would you say that you should prepare for that as a part of your retirement as well? Uh, definitely. Um, and again, it, because aging isn't a one size fits all, you know, some people live to be 99 or still run in marathons and die in their sleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, right. Um, right. So, <laughs> Age is not really the determining factor for frailty. It's more of a lifestyle and genetic Mm -hmm. determination for frailty. So um, care uh, in the United States is very complicated, very fragmented, and, Mm -hmm. um, and difficult to figure out if you don't really understand the system. So most people say, oh, I will be fine because I have me- I'm going to get Medicare when I'm, you know, 62 right. or 65. Mm-hmm. But uh, that is not the case. Medicare does not pay for a lot. Now, I will say that because of this pandemic in the last year, mm-hmm. a lot of emphasis on care at home because it was the safer place to be in this last year. Right. A lot of emphasis has been placed on that. And a couple of things happened. Uh, one is that the the medical community, the hospital systems and the skilled nursing facilities really started to realize the value of home-based care. Mm-hmm. And the second thing that happened is the use of technology. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about sophisticated technology. I'm talking about just using even, you know, iPads or iPhones or tablets right. to be able to communicate. And so um, it really has opened up the healthcare professionals' understanding of how they can monitor care at home and how they can be present. I've got quotes around present mm-hmm. using technology so that there's some supervision in the home that is really pretty adequate. So, um, so let me back up to your cost scenario. There are two distinct um, ways that home care is paid for. One is private pay, and yes, that is very expensive. However, it's probably the largest growing segment of the health care delivery system because just the sheer numbers of people mm-hmm. that are getting older and needing care. And the there's lots and lots of um, of home care services being started and, and growing all over the country. The other end of the spectrum is if you have very little money. I'm speaking of less than three thousand dollars in assets. Mm-hmm. Then you, the long-term uh, community services, home-based services, through the Medicaid program in the various states, uh, uh, often does provide care. Um, and the the only problem with that is Medicaid is a combination of state and federal funds, and it is governed solely by the state. So the rules and regulations vary by each 50 states. So Mm -hmm. some have quite liberal, wonderful 
programs that are um, community home-based programs funded by Medicaid and others have less options available. So it really is going to matter where you live. Uh, one of the things I would caution your listeners, if they do have parents with with pretty limited resources, and um, is to contact an elder law attorney and make certain that if you if you do have limited resources that you are planning how you're going to spend down those resources so that you are Medicaid eligible when the time comes. So it, again, it's a very complicated system, which is again why I recommend a care manager because there's absolutely no way that you could learn all of the nuances of what's available right. and who can provide it. Um, there's just there's just so many different options. And again, your care options will be different, whether you have a mental and a cognitive decline or whether you have a physical decline. Mm-hmm. So we have a we do not have a uniform system of care that is fail safe for people that allows people not to fall through the cracks. So you really do have to have someone who manages the care, someone who's paying attention to what types of care are available and needed and appropriate, and try to match the family's resources, both financial and and, and physical support of other family members, match that with the reality of the situation. So um, it's not it's not um, undoable, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it really is right, right. feasible to, mm-hmm. to do it. If you really want to age in place, it for most situations, one can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I always like to say the, the determining factor is if the person needing care can get up and down out of a chair or the bed and make it to the bathroom. And if they can't do that, then mm-hmm. that really does create a scenario where the care becomes 24-7, and that is quite expensive um, and and burdensome. Right, right. And especially because, you know, as we get older, you still want to have your independency. So when they feel like they're starting, as as humans, we feel like we're starting to lose that independency, then that's when usually problems kick in (laughs) because we get stubborn, (laughs) right, as we get older. Yes. So, yes. yeah, well, but... if you were stubborn as a younger person, you're going to get more stubborn as you get older. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever our personality is, it tends to, right. uh, you know, be uh, get bigger. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think, you know, we have some of the opposite. They either go to the childlike scenario or either you said they continue to have that, that adult authority figure that's constantly getting crazier <laughs> as you get older. So, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it's, it's, you know, like I said, we, it's kind of, you know, we joke about it, but it's definitely the truth, you know, about how we become as we, you know, start to age and we start to think differently and our attitudes are a little differently. But when it comes to that independency, that is the number one thing I have seen and have learned, you know, as I've watched some of my um, family get older, that they don't want to lose that. And, and that's, you know, they get hard headed about it. I'm just like, okay, really? <laughs> so it's like, how are we going to get through this? You know, but you know, you do and, and you work around it and everything works out the way it needs to be but th- this information is just so important that we're talking about um, tonight and I'm hoping that the listeners are actually truly tuning in and realizing that this is a reality you know if you live long enough to get old this is the reality of what you have to prepare for and like I said earlier we just don't always think that way because you know of course when you're young you think you're gonna live forever and nothing's ever gonna happen to you but you know it's really like I said it's not even about age anything can happen to you at any point in your life and you have to be prepared for it so as you have gone through many years of you know, having this amazing business starting 81 and of course, you know, in 1998, you started the core cubed and you're still a part of all that. And you're still running around and doing speaking engagements and all these other things. Talk a little bit about all the success that you've had and what you are doing currently today, especially, um, we all know we had to do some pivoting from 2020. So we'll talk a little bit about your success and what's going on today. Um, I will tell you, I my first job out of college was as a programmer systems analyst, programmer first, then, then systems analyst. Mm-hmm. And that particular experience, which I was totally not suited for personality-wise, <laughs> but um, – because I'm I'm an extrovert, and in order to program and do systems analysis, you pretty much have to you know yes. be an introvert and and love numbers. I was good at it. It wasn't that I wasn't good at it, but mm-hmm. what it did was it really opened up for me what is possible through technology. 
So when I started the first business, the elder care solutions business, um, I, I really used technology in a major way. Um, and we created a program that allowed us to schedule, you know, home care is 24-7, 365. Right. So we, we used very early technology where we connected the office computers with someone at home so we could keep the office open 24-7, 365. But we didn't have to physically be in the office. So that was my first real introduction to the possibilities with technology. So mm-hmm. when I sold that business, I... I started Core Cubed with the idea that I could work from anywhere. I had actually one of our clients um, who was also in my Rotary Club, his wife had died and we cared for her till she died. And my staff kept saying, you really ought to get to know this man because he he has just been so amazing to mm-hmm. his, his, you know, ailing wife. And I did. And we got married. So oh, wow. part of his that it's a fabulous love story but our um our life together we said well let's work hard and then we'll travel in our spare time so um so i created core cubed in 1998 as a company as a virtual company a little you know probably 10 15 years ahead of its time exactly so, But because of that, do you know the pandemic last year? We, when we uh, entered into the pandemic, a couple of things. Number one is we specialize in digital marketing. So uh, that really became the only way a lot of companies could actually get clients and appeal to clients and grow their businesses during the pandemic. So we really were totally positioned to to um, accept you know bigger workloads greater workloads we we have a really well loyal team so um, so we do a really good job but but the pandemic introduced people who were reticent to use digital marketing introduced them to that as the only way they could market so we really uh, I've sort of been at the right place at the right time yeah and. Um, and so our business has has grown a lot, and of course we've been used to working virtually, so that mm-hmm. wasn't new for us. We've been doing that for twenty three years, and um, and we've just really embraced what we need to do to help other people too. We have other clients now who are saying, you know, we don't need to go back to the office. We think mm-hmm. we could work remotely. So now we're actually even consulting with some of our clients about how do they do a better job of working remotely and still having a good business model that's, uh, you know, that's continuing to grow. Right. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. Like I said, it, it, to hear about virtual back in 1998 w- was completely unheard of. I've never heard anybody talk about doing anything virtual in 98. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we, you know, we see little tips here and there. I mean, I can remember when I started using an actual computer, which was back in 84, 85, you know, <laughs> so because mm-hmm. I tell people I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, yeah, you know, we had typewriters and, you know, back in the early eighties and they were like a typewriter, <laughs> you know, so, so to go from that and then you were already doing something virtual and had, I mean, literally was already in that arena. And then now here it is 2020, nobody could have ever told us in 2020, we would have to go this direction. And I talk a lot about, you know, five years ago when I restarted my business, I I wanted to do it all virtual and people laughed at me. They were like, oh, nobody's going to do that. And nobody wants to be, you know, they want you to be in front of them. And then of course we had no choice. We were brought to our knees pretty much, you know, and you had no choice. You're stuck at home. You do what you have to do and you make things work. And you're right. The business, more, more and more business have be, have excelled uh, because they have utilized this um, virtual world that we're living in. And of course, now we're doing a lot Mm -hmm. more uh, bringing back some of the hybrid type businesses where you're having a little bit of both. And I think that's a, it's a great way to do business and, you know, to be able to give people the opportunity to not have to worry about leaving their home every time they may think they have a sniffle, so to speak, you know, get on your tele, get, do your uh, virtual and you're, you know, you're going to do it telewise versus having to get in the car, drive, you know, 20 miles or sit in traffic. Of course, out here in DC, we're always in traffic. So, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> you know, but it's just, it's just remarkable how, you, you know, we live in a world where you think you have to do everything one way and then all of a sudden things turn around 
around where you realize that you can have that flexibility and, and it's made people come out of their comfort zone. And like I said, your model has been around so long that by the time this all did hit, it was really no big deal. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but it was like, hey, now you have expanded even further because you're teaching other people how to do something you've been doing since 1998, which is a crazy, you know, the more I keep thinking about how many years ago that was, um, <laughs> that you've, you know, that you've excelled in that. And uh, it just, like I said, just goes to prove every day that you have to be forward focused. You know, you can't always be stagnant and be afraid to come out of your comfort zone because you just never know what is going to happen. And, and now you have set, you have set the tone many years ago that people are now trying to jump on the bandwagon. Like I always tell people, you're already behind the curb if you haven't already started doing certain things that should have been done some time ago, you know, because usually it's because of fear because you're just comfortable is usually what most people, you know, end up being. And so now that they are out of that comfort zone, you know, uh, they're all picking up on this new industry, <clears throat> excuse me, a care, way of marketing and doing business. So in the futuristic perspective, what is it that you're telling these um, new so-called experts industry today? You know, the, the thing that I, well, number one is for your technology, you really have to have a good bandwidth because there's nothing more aggravating than trying to talk to people and they stop <laughs> <laughs> they, they freeze up. So the the other thing that has made us very successful is the fact that we recognize the fact that we actually need a um, a program. We use Basecamp to manage the projects, mm-hmm. and there's lots of different. The reason we use it is we that's what we've been using for a long time. There may be a better way to do it, but it certainly has worked for us. And that's the one thing that I think is really important when you're working virtually, mm-hmm. because you the, you have to have a way to see what's going on so you know if you've got 10 people on a project and everyone's assigned to do things you can't uh go to each of them and say how are you doing what are you doing you know constantly so if you have it set up correctly from a um from a management standpoint then you can actually determine progress on projects and you can see if there's any issues and so mm-hmm. it's that has been an absolute godsend to us because it allows us to you know, run lots and lots of projects and be able to to just sort of, you know, stop in and make certain that everything is going on, just, you know, looking at it from a um, from a management standpoint. Right. So I think that that having that is uh, project management component has mm-hmm. been crucial. Um, so I and I, I highly recommend that. And I have clients now who are are doing more virtually and being successful, but they haven't quite determined how they're going to do that management of their workforce. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the one the one part that I think uh, needs more uh, emphasis if someone wants to actually work virtually, because you really do need to, from a management standpoint, you need to be able to look at stuff and from a, a moment's you know glance figure out what's going on. The other interesting thing is when you're working virtually, it's really easy to determine who's working and who's not working. That's (laughs) right. Very easy. And, you know, when you're with people, their personalities actually make you um, like them or not like them and think, you know, be more favorable about what they're doing. But when when you're working virtually, it's everybody's the same. You know, there's no color. There's no education. There's no. Whatever Absolutely. it's just yes, you just are looking at results and yeah. and it may it really makes for a great um it makes for a great working environment, I think, although I do like to get together with people <laughs> right right so, right, yeah, every now um, and then it's which great. we have it. Yeah. So these the Zoom meetings though, I swear. I you know, we've been do, using Zoom for years and mm-hmm. I never thought I mean now I'm on Zoom all day long mm-hmm. and I do not like that. Um <laughs> I much preferred having some time I wasn't on Zoom, but now everybody's doing Zoom. So, exactly. you know, whether it's volunteer work or work work, it's all on Zoom. So, um, and I've got a great collection now of necklaces and tops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because nobody gets to see you from the waist down. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I, I get you on that one. But yeah, I mean, you're right. I love the how you're talking about how important it is to understand project management and realizing that 
everybody is literally at the same level when you're virtually and you're working from home because I, I always used to hear and I was like, so tired of hearing it. Oh, we need everybody in the office so we can see what you're doing. I'm like, you waste more time chitter chatting instead of getting work done <laughs> when you're in the mm-hmm, office, you know. Mm-hmm. And now everybody has to perform at the same level, whether they like it or not. And you can tell when people aren't performing when you're working virtually because mm-hmm. you can see the the workload go down or up, or they're just not doing their part because everybody has to maintain their part when they're virtually because they're not combined together, and you can't just push off that work to somebody else when you're standing in front of them versus you're doing it yourself. So I love that attitude. And you're definitely right that project management is absolutely a must, no matter what business you're doing. I've been doing project management for almost 20 years or more. And, you know, before project management was ever called project management, it was always project management. But, you know, of course, now everybody's making money because they can say, okay, go out and get this certificate. Certificate. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> another way to do something you know gotta have this can you have a degree you gotta have this certification I'm like okay well, well that's another whole topic of conversation we'll have to get into <laughs> some other day but it's one of my pet peeves you know but I just think that it's just important that people understand that there are definitely specific things in business that are, that you need to have as a part of your foundation and you've and you've mentioned those very clearly you know to the listeners about what it means to be in business but I want to ask you one of the thing that is always somebody I'm sure asking you, what do you do to start a business? What good advice would you give them about starting a business, Marley? Uh, well, number one, I think um, you really have to be passionate about whatever you're doing. And the second thing would be always hire people that are smarter and better at whatever it is you're trying to get done than you are. So if you're always hiring up and and you're not, um, and you're confident <laughs> that the people you're hiring know more than you do, then you will always continue to grow because you're not limited by your own limitations. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I think having faith in yourself and um, and being persistent, I always, there's a great quote about persistence being the, it's sort of the end all be all. And I would agree with that. Now that's, assuming that your idea is good <laughs> right. and uh, and that people are going to pay you what it is you're charging for whatever you're offering. But, um, but I really think persistence is the key and, and self confidence that, because you used to mention something earlier about people laughing at you or saying something, you know, it, you really have to be confident in yourself and know that what you're doing is right. So, um, that's a lot of things. That's not just one thing. But I think the biggest thing is is when you're hiring people, make certain that you're always hiring people that, that know more than you do and are better than whatever it is you're trying to hire for. Exactly. So that way you'll always grow. Yeah, exactly. Because like to say, if you think you're the, if you're the smartest person in the room, then what's the purpose, right? <laughs> Everybody in here. Exactly. So. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, we always have a few of those and not no better than everybody <laughs> else. You know, you, you, that's just a part of being in business or, or doing anything in life, really. Um, but, you know, this has been a phenomenal um, conversation and I have learned so much about what it means to, you know, get it, get the understanding of aging and what aging care business is about and, and how to deal with the different agencies and what comes with that. Cause like I said, we have had our own family experience with it and I wasn't as involved as much as my, my mom and her, her siblings, but they definitely learn a lot in, um, you know, being able to have this information and sharing with people, I think is really important in, in preparing yourself for your future. Because like you said, we all live long enough. We are all going to age and these are things that we need to think about. But Merle, you have been a phenomenal guest. But before we end the show, uh, like I said, if there's anything that you want to talk about as in reference to you, we have something new coming up. Um, do you have any um uh, anything you want to share in that perspective, uh, please let us know. And then of course, let us know how we can get a hold of you. If you, if people are interested in learning more about core cubed or need information about care management for their families. Well, I'm going to start with my help choose home podcast, which is available anywhere. Podcasts are available and it's, uh, we start our fourth season this year. So the whole concept behind the Help Choose Home podcast is to uh, make it easier for consumers to understand this very complicated care at home process. So um, so that's in its fourth season. That starts soon. And anywhere podcasts can be found, you can find Help Choose Home. Uh, Core Cubed is corecubed.com. And we are 
uh, pretty much everywhere, all through social media and on the web. And we do a lot of of outreach and community education about Help Choose Home. And then I mentioned also that I work for Access, which is a global healthcare technology company. And um, Access is always looking for talent and um, and skill. And because of the pandemic, there is no location requirement now. We have offices in Mumbai, in Lagos, Nigeria, in the Philippines, and in Dallas, Texas. So, um, and I can be reached there as well. So, um, that's pretty much what I'm doing and how you can reach me. Well, there's no reason that we cannot find you. So, <laughs> and, and I always love talking to a fellow podcaster. So, hello. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know you were into podcasting. So, that's even better. Yes, so. I am. Definitely a great podcast show. So I have to look that up and share that information because it's like you said, it's, you know, learning and trying to understand what it's going to take to get prepared. Ask those questions that you don't know that, that that's a great, um, definitely a great podcast. And I always tell people in business, if you don't have a podcast show, you are definitely behind the curb. You got to have a podcast show because this is where you learn so much and that you can share at a further reach, you know, to get the information out there to people so that they can have an understanding of who you are, what you're doing. And then of course, what they can do in order to make things easier for themselves and their families. So congratulations on the podcast show in the fourth season. And again, I thank you for coming on to the show with me this evening. Really, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you, Kimberly. It's been my pleasure and I hope that you stay safe. And thank you. I am and I will. And you also do the same and enjoy, you know, you're traveling around and hanging out and doing what you love to do, of course. And for everyone else, I hope you have enjoyed this evening's show. But before we close tonight, we have learned a lot about the insights into the future of aging care what you need to do, how to prepare for yourselves uh, as you start thinking about retirement, even prior to that. And as um, Merle said, if you have questions, you can find her on all social media platforms, as well as listening to the podcast show anywhere that you, that you listen to your podcast today. And it also leads me to ask my listeners, what do you wish to existed for you in 2021 is I'm asking that because a lot of times people think that everything has to be done in quarters or has to be done every year. Everything should be thought about daily. Think about what it is you want to do. You can start now. You're never too old to start doing something that you love. You're never too, it's never too soon. It's never too late. So just if you're interested you want to learn about how to use your voice in a certain way, whether it's being an author, maybe even doing a podcast show, as we've been talking about here just a few minutes ago, please reach out to me and just chat with me about your goals so we can help you get moving. You can reach out to me at Kimberly, WSBILC at gmail.com. And you also can uh, reach out to me through the website at www.wsbilc.com and as well I want to remind you all that we are doing a campaign raising $5,000 to add additional show and also do some free virtual live Q&A sessions with our favorite entrepreneurs that you guys have heard here. And we've interviewed more than 200. So you have plenty to choose from and plenty of questions and, and answers and get more resources for your success. And again, we'd like to thank you all for listening to tonight's show. We'll be back next week with more amazing guests. Be sure to follow us right here on iHeartRadio or either download our mobile app on Google Play or wherever you listen to your podcast. But until then, you all enjoy the rest of your evening and good night. Good night, everyone. We will be back next Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Follow us on Spreaker, www.spreaker.com slash user slash WSBI. View our new WSBI website anytime at www.wsbillc.com and on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. 